Good morning. Good to see you here today. Good to be in God's cold house, air-conditioned house. I'm, I'm glad you're here today. I'm excited to share with you this second message, what in the world is going to happen. So it's good to have you here. Everyone here, would you raise your hand? Some of you are still out here, but that's okay. You're here physically, but maybe not in your mind. Did you know that there are more references to the second coming of Jesus Christ than there are to his first coming? Did you know that? Every time the second coming of Jesus Christ is mentioned one time, there, in fact, it's a factor of eight to one. Every time the Bible mentions Jesus being born as a baby on earth, there are eight times it talks about him coming back a second time. So, it, in fact, scholars say that 1,845 different biblical references are regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's all over the Bible. In the Old Testament, 17 books out of the Old Testament books talk about the return of Christ. In the New Testament, 23 of the 27 books talk about the return of Christ. Seven out of ten chapters in the Old Testament and the New Testament talk about the return of Christ. One out of every thirty sentences in the New Testament teaches that Jesus Christ is coming back to earth again. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Eight to one. Now this is, as I mentioned, the second message in this series I'm calling What on Earth is Going to Happen. Last week we talked about what Jesus predicted would happen and did happen and is presently happened. The first thing we talked about, that Jesus said the temple would be destroyed, in which it was in A.D. 70. The second thing he predicted was if his followers would be persecuted, and they were, and they still are today. And the third thing he predicted is that the gospel would be preached around the world, and it was and still is today. But now we're going to talk about things, Jesus is going to talk about things that are going to happen in the future have not yet happened. So let's read about it in Mark 13, verses 14 through 27. Would you stand with me together in honor of God's word? Let's read it together. Mark 13, 14 through 27. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then the, let those who are in Jude, Judea flee to the mountains that no one on the housetops go down or enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning, when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them, the days. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's a Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Father, we thank you this morning for your word that proclaims that you didn't just come once as a babe in Bethlehem, but you're coming back again. You've told us time and time again. So help us. Give us insight and wisdom about what you're trying to teach us about the future. The things that include what's going to happen to people even listening to this message. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. 
Now, I've always enjoyed studying history. You know, I started out in college as a history major. And prophecy is interesting because it's history in reverse. In history, you study what happened in the past. Prophecy tells us it's what's going to be history in the future. What's going to be happened in the future. In fact, Isaiah 48.10, God says, from the, from the beginning, I revealed the end. From long ago, I told you things that had not yet happened, saying, my plan will stand and I'll do everything I intended to do. So what Jesus is doing in these verses we just read is pulling back the curtain to give us a glimpse of the future. Now, three future truths that Jesus talks about. Number one, he says, after Jesus takes his bride home, after Jesus takes his bride home, there will be a time of global chaos. He says in Mark 13, 19, those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Now let me give you a, a brief timeline of the events that I believe that God, uh, the Bible is talking about will happen. Uh, there, as I understand them. Now, not everybody agrees on the particulars of what's going to happen, and there will be other people who disagree, but, but Generally speaking, most evangelical Bible-believing Christians believe what I'm going to say, so I'm going to tell you what I believe is true, and other people may have a different opinion, and that's okay, they can be wrong. Just a joke. But here are the timelines, and that is, the very next thing that's going to happen is a rapture of the church. Jesus is going to return in the clouds, the Bible tells us, and he's going to snatch away his bride. The Bible talks about that. That's the church, believers, followers of Jesus Christ. And he's going to take us to his father's home. So what Jesus is saying here is I'm taking you to my father's house. You remember in the Old Testament, there are analogies of Jesus being the bridegroom and the church, his followers, being the bride. Now what happened in biblical days in the New Testament times is when a Hebrew groom or bridegroom got engaged, then he would go to his father's house and prepare a place for him, his bride, to live. And it was kind of like a game. As soon as he got this place prepared for him, his bride, to live, they would sneak in sneak back in with his new bride into his father's house. Jesus said in John 14, 2 and 3, my father's house, or in my, my father's house has many rooms, if it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Or would I have done that? And if you go, if I go and prepare a place for you, my father is the bride, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now, the rapture is mentioned several times in the Bible, but he doesn't talk about it here in Mark 13. We're going to talk about it because the rapture is an event that ushers in a time of global chaos. Now, the word rapture here is interesting. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we're told that Jesus, when he comes back, he's going to come back in the clouds, and he's not going to touch earth. He's going to come back through the clouds, and then he's going to gather his, his children to himself. What, actually, three things will happen. First will be a shout, and then a trumpet sound, announcing the return of Christ. If you can imagine a shout louder than I could say, because it would blow out your ears if I did it, but this huge shout, and then a trumpet sound. And then the bodies of those who have fallen Christ but have died will come up from the grave and go to meet Jesus in the air. And the third thing is those who have fallen Christ still living on earth, they will rise up to the air and meet Christ as well. They use the phrase, caught up. In fact, the Bible says Christ, those who are alive, will be caught up together with to meet the Lord in the air. 
And that word caught up is the Greek word harpazo. Now, the first language the Bible was translated into from Greek was Latin. And so when they translated that word, that Greek word harpazo into Latin, it became the word raptio. And that's where we get our word rapture from. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 tells us, it will happen suddenly, quicker than the blink of an eye. At the sound of the last trumpet, the dead will be raised, and all will be changed so that we will never die again. Can you imagine what that scene will be like? When millions of Christians, in an instant, less than the blink of an eye, will suddenly disappear. The news will call this the most catastrophic natural disaster to ever occur on planet Earth. But it is not a natural disaster. It's a supernatural departure. And imagine the chaos when millions of Christians are gone and the communication systems are broken down and the transportation systems are not working, the infrastructure is, is not together. There will be utter chaos. That's why it's called the time of tribulation. Now, we get that word tribulation, the King James translation of the Bible. In Mark 24, 21, the Bible says, Jesus said this, For then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. Now, there have been terrible times in history. We know that. But this, if you can think of all the pestilences and all the diseases, and all the plagues and famines and, and drought and bloody wars, all of those throughout history, the Bible says this time of tribulation will be worse than all of those combined. The tribulation will be a horrific, the most horrific event in the history of the world. So when you compare Mark 13 and Daniel and Revelation, scholars believe that tribulation will last seven years. The first three and a half years will, will not be that, that hard, that bad. You'll see those who are living, you'll see things getting bad. But it won't affect you personally so much. But the last three and a half years will be like hell on earth. It'll be the most horrible time in human history. Now, this chaotic tribulation described in Revelation verses, or chapter 6 through 18, specifically, and it tells us three things are going to happen. First of all, seven seals on scrolls will be opened. And each seal will announce a judgment of, of those people living on the earth, a judgment for their disobedience to God. The second thing that happened, well, seven trumpets will sound, and each trumpet sounding will announce uh, even harsher and worse affliction. Can you imagine living in that time, and here you are, and you've been left, and you hear the first trumpet, and these horrible things are going to happen, you think, I've got six more, and each one are going to be worse than this. And then the third thing is seven bowls of wrath will be poured out. Well, what is wrath? You think of it as anger, but it's, it's not human anger. You, you know, you've been mad. You've seen people mad. You've experienced anger. But you, you know, I'm, when, when you talk about rage, it's uncontrolled anger. But, but God's wrath is not uncontrolled. God's wrath is fair and it's measured and it's his response of holiness to evil. God's wrath will instantly, immediately, and forever cancel evil. You might be getting nervous thinking, no, I don't want to live in this time. I don't blame you. I don't either. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, 
you won't be here. I'm convinced of that more so today than ever before because I'm learning more about the Bible the longer I live. And, and there's two reasons why I'm convinced we won't be here. True followers of Jesus. Now, here's the, there will be people who say, I believe in Jesus, but they're not really following him. And they will be here. But people who are really following Jesus, they'll be raptured with Jesus And two reasons why I believe that. First reason is that when you read the book of Revelation, the church is mentioned um, 28 times in the first three chapters. It's all about the church. From chapter 4 to the last chapter of Revelation, the church is not mentioned one time. And in those chapters are the description of the tribulation. So I believe that's evidence the church won't be here. The true followers of Christ will not be here. Now this building will be here and other church buildings will be here and there will be people who will gather here and say, oh my God. But the redeemed blood of Christ those ordained by him will not be here. Now, can you make it to heaven if you're here? Yeah, you can, but you're going to go through incredible tortures and suffering and likely be martyred. It's not going to be fun. The first reason is that we're not mentioned in the tribulation. The second reason is Revelation 3.10. Jesus promised us this, Revelation 3.10. Since you have kept my commands to endure patiently, <laughs> I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. There are two reasons why I believe that, that followers of Christ will be raptured and will be with him in eternity. We'll be with Jesus. We'll meet him in the air. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, 18 tells us we will be with the Lord forever. <laughs> forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Here's the second truth that Jesus tells us. During this time, a global leader will stand in the temple and demand to be worshipped. A global leader will stand in the temple and demand to be worshipped. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. So when the church is removed, Christians removed, godly people removed, not only will the Spirit of God be taken from humans because they're going up into heaven. But all the godly influences in society will be gone. So this global chaos will result in mass confusion, devastation, and in the middle of all that chaos, this world leader is going to rise up and he's going to bring all the nations together, and they're going to create this one world government. Now, the Bible calls this leader different terms, different phrases. Daniel calls him the king who is to come. Apostle John calls him the Antichrist. Revelation is referred to as the beast. And the Apostle Paul calls him the man of lawlessness. But that leader is going to bring together all the nations of the world into a global alliance. I will never forget watching on television a speech given by George H.W. Bush to the Joint Sessions of Congress, September 11, 1990. My jaw dropped when I heard him say this. We stand today at a unique and extraordinary moment, the crisis in the Persian Gulf 
grave as it is, also offers a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, the New World Order. That's when my job, my job drop. Can emerge a new era, freer from the threat of terror, stronger to the, in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest of peace. An era in which the nations of the world, east and west, north and south, can prosper and live in harmony. Not true, but that's what it's then if you remember 1999, CBS news anchor Walter Cronkite spoke of the United Nations of his dream of one world government. He said to do that, of course, the Americans have to yield up some of their sovereignty. Why do you suppose that's happening now? Preparation. We take a lot of courage, a lot of faith in the new order. It didn't happen. Jesus talked about the abomination that causes desolation. What that is, is a sacrilegious action that will take place by this global leader in the Jewish temple. Daniel mentions this three times. In fact, in Daniel 9.27, he says, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. One seven period of time. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out upon him. In other words, the things that are in store for the Antichrist are going to pour out on him. So we know this Antichrist will first show up as a peacemaker, and everybody's going to say, This guy's great. He's going to negotiate peace. A seven-year treaty, we don't know all of the groups, you know, different people have ideas, but we don't for, know for sure the different nations or groups that are going to be together. But a treaty of seven years is going to happen. So imagine someone to bring together the Muslims and the Israelites into some treaty. The abomination that causes desolation. Now, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I, I, I'm just speculating that it could be a moderate Muslim. Who knows? They could bring together the Muslims and the Israelites, the Jewish people. And so we know that there's no Jewish temple today. Uh, but if there were, the Israelites could construct it very quickly. Now, if you remember... The original temple, the tabernacle, was a tent. And the outside of this particular tent, the first one was 150 feet by 75 feet, but the inside, the Holy of Holies, that tent itself, that tabernacle, was only 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. About half the size of a single wide mobile home. It wasn't a big space. So if they put up a tent, they could do that overnight. Very easy. But here's an interesting piece of news that was reported by CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, December 31st, 19, are you ready for this? 69, over 50 years ago. This is what they reported. Just a few steps away from the Western Wall, or the Wailing Wall, Rabbis and craftsmen are building what they call a temple in waiting. The director of the Temple Institute, whose name is Kayam Richman, said the Temple Institute is actively engaged in the research and preparation for the redemption of service in the Holy Temple to the extent of actually preparing operational blueprints for the construction of the Temple according to the most modern standards. The menorah is just one of the vessels, several vessels being created. It is covered with 95 pounds of pure gold and has a price of $2 million, 1969 money. Piece by piece, the third temple is taking shape with priest garments, vessels of copper, gold, and silver, and a new generation of Levite priests specially trained for temple service. Then he says, we have enough in place now 
to resume divine service and to build the temple. 1969. There have been other reports that stated that the temple is already pre-built. It's underground facility. All the panels are our built. In a matter of a few hours, they can take it from underground to on top and put it into place, construct it. Now, what is on the Temple Mount today? If you know anything at all about Israel, you know that the Dome of Iraq is set on the mound, the Temple Mount, and that is, of course, a Muslim mosque. But it's not exactly on that place. There are many Jewish scholars who believe that the actual location of the temple is 200 feet north of the Dome of the Rock. So if you can imagine, this Antichrist, this charismatic leader who comes on as a peace, you know, first of all, as a peace giver, making this seven-year treaty between the Muslims and the Israelites, to where they negotiate to divide this 36-acre 36, 36 temple mount section, a Jewish, a Jewish section and Muslim section, so the Jews would be able to rebuild their temple beside the Dome of the Rock and provide a place for the Antichrist to do his sacrilegious act called the abomination that causes desolation. They all talked about this in 2 Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will, come, will not come until the re rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The Antichrist will stand up in the temple and say, I'm God. Bow down and worship me. And that will be the abomination. Can you imagine Jewish priests, the Jewish people in that temple? When he stands up and does that, they say, this is an abomination. They get up in mass and leave the temple. The domination, abomination that results in desolation. The temple is deserted. Now, Christ, is all, Christ has always called us to worship him, but Satan has called us to worship him. In fact, that was the reason he was kicked out of heaven. He said, don't worship God, worship me instead. I'm the worship leader, I'm the song leader, I'm the man, worship me. And remember when he tempted Jesus, one of the things he said is, bow down and worship me. But the Jews are going to refuse to worship this antichrist, this self-centered, narcissistic, narcissistic, pompous megalomaniac. And it's going to cause this divide between the Antichrist and the Jews. And the result of that, the Antichrist is going to gather together this mammoth army from all the nations of the world. And they're going to do everything they can to destroy Israel. And they're going to gather the staging area about 60 miles north of Jerusalem, a place the Bible calls Armageddon. It's a valley called Megiddo. And the Jews will be outnumbered 1,000 to 1. Here's the third thing Jesus talked about. Jesus will return to win the final battle and establish his kingdom. Jesus will return to win the final battle and establish his kingdom. Mark 13, 26. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Now, when I was a kid, I loved to watch Western shows about cowboys and Indians. And the classic scene that we've all seen many times are the soldiers 
You know, the wagons are in a circle and the soldiers are shooting, the Indians are outside, and there's just tons of Indians just overwhelming the cowboys, so many more Indians than cowboys. And, and here in this desperate situation, where they're running out of ammunition, and your heart is beating fast. He's not going to make it. They're down the last bullet. Then they had no more bullets. And just at that time, the cavalry, you hear them coming because they're announcing they're coming. by the cavalry, right? I imagine that's what it's going to be like. We're going to be living here in this world thinking, man, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And what am I going to do? We're not an issue. We can't, we can't fight this battle any longer. And Jesus is going to appear in this, the sky like the cavalry. And we're going to be resurrected to him. It's going to be a short battle, battle in Armageddon. Because Jesus is going, the Bible tells us how it's going to be win the war. This is interesting. God told the Apostle Paul what would happen in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, and then the lawless one, Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. He doesn't have bad breath. He simply says a word. You're defeated. One word, Satan is defeated. Today, we still defeat Satan with the words of our mouth. You're tempted to say, Satan, get away from me. The blood of Jesus covers my life. I do not receive what you're trying to give to me. I tell you to leave and leave now. You're instantly victorious and he's defeated. God revealed this climactic scene to the Apostle John, the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 19, verses 11, 12, 15, and 16. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that, has, that no one, but he knows himself. But no one knows but he himself. Verse 15, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nation. What is that sword? The word of God. Verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has written this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God also revealed this final battle to the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 14, 3, 9. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. So what, what's the weapon that he uses? The word of God proceeds out of his mouth. Martin Luther, in that great hymn, he wrote, A mighty fortress is our God. In one verse he wrote about this. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not at him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word will fell him. Just one word against Satan will defeat him. He'll fall down like a tree fell. So let's come back to the present day. Nobody knows when Jesus is going to come back. He tells us to watch the signs of the time and says it. 
is coming closer, and we know by the signs of the time, the return of Christ is closer today than ever before. We're seeing some of the things that have to happen for the return of Christ to take place. The United States will have to be killed, defeated, and it's gradually happening. So the question is, are you ready to meet him? In the spring of 1980, I'll never forget this either. The blue skies over the state of Washington became obscured by steam rising from mountain, Mount St. Helens. Geologists had been warning for some time, several months, that an eruption was imminent. Residents near the area were told repeatedly to evacuate. State troopers, forest rangers, with loudspeakers would, would, would blare, danger, evacuate the area immediately. Flashing road signs were erected along, along the road saying, warning, 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 evacuate immediately. For months they've been giving this message. They knew that Mount St. Helena was going to erupt. Steam was already put in the air. An 83-year-old man by the name of Harry Truman, not to be confused with President Truman, lived in the area his entire life. He operated a log at Spirit Lake, five miles from Mount St. Helens. When he was told to evacuate, he just laughed at the warning. Repeatedly, Fisher would go to his cabin, try to persuade him to leave, but he stubbornly refused. But finally, he was granted permission to stay. Want to die? You can't stop him. This is what Harry said. Nobody knows more about this mountain than old Harris. Wouldn't dare blow up on me. But on the morning of May 18, 1980, Harry woke up and imagined followed his normal habits of feeding his 16 cats. Then he prepared his own breakfast. Then at 8.37 a.m., Mount St. Helens exploded with the force of a 30, 23 megaton atom bomb. The air was instantly heated to 600 degrees. Instantly. Old Harry never heard a thing. He was melted. The instant it erupted. Shockwave of energy traveled faster than the speed of sound. All this happened before he, he ever heard anything. It was followed by a 50-foot high wave of mud. It looks like a river. That's 50 foot high mud. Flattened out everything with 150 square foot miles. Square foot miles. Eruption was formed a cloud of ash. Go back to the cloud of ash. Deep as 150 feet. They were trying to recover a car overcoming one place. They never found a trace of here. His cat or his cabin. I wonder if anything went through his mind. In the millisecond, he felt that 600 degrees breeze hit him. I wonder if anything went through his mind. He gambled and lost. He heard the warnings, but he ignored them. The reason why. And I'll talk about the second coming of Christ so many times as compared to the first coming. It's because he doesn't want anyone to not be warned. At any moment, Jesus can return. God has placed the signs around us. Warn you, repent, turn back from, turn back from your sins, turn to God. So the question is, will you laugh like Harry? Or will you take it seriously?
Are you ready to meet God? And here's, a, here's another important question. The people that you love, are they ready to meet God? Love causes us to fall on our face. God, help me. Examine my heart. I want to be ready. But just as important, the people in my life who are not ready, I need to tell them Jesus loves them, has a purpose for them. 